Today's case takes us to Nanaimo, British Columbia, Canada, where a young woman seemingly vanished without a trace in 2002. After sending a chilling text to a friend, Lisa Marie Young disappeared and to this day, 21 years later, her whereabouts still remain a mystery. Lisa Marie Young was born on May 5th, 1981 to her parents, Don and Joanne Young. Lisa was the eldest of three children. She had two younger brothers, Brian and Robbie, and the Young family lived in Nanaimo, British Columbia. Lisa adored her younger brothers and was very protective of them. Lisa's mother said she was almost like a little mother to them. She was always looking out for them and guiding them through life. But like every older sister, she could be a bit bossy sometimes. But regardless, as they got older, the three of them remained very close. Actually, their family as a whole was close and Lisa had a good relationship with her parents. She often would refer to her father as her best friend. From the time she was small, Lisa was always said to be a girly girl. She loved everything pink, she always wanted to wear pink clothing, pink headbands, and pink nail polish. When she got her first bike at four years old, it was a pink one with streamers on the handlebars. She loved beadwork and glitter, honestly anything that sparkled. She was pretty artistic and was always making or beating something. She also loved painting, music, and dance. Lisa was said to be a very caring person. In fact, she was just a toddler when she became a vegetarian because of her love for animals. Lisa always loved sports, especially basketball. In grade eight, she joined the school basketball team and her family had a great time watching her at her games. When Lisa decided to try out for the basketball team in high school, her parents were really excited for her. They were surprised when Lisa came home in tears because she didn't make the team. Her mother remembers her daughter feeling actually quite devastated, but nothing could get Lisa down for long. She was said to be pretty stubborn. Well, she was a Taurus and fit the description to a T. She was headstrong, independent, and confident. She would never argue for the sake of arguing, but if she believed she was right, she would not back down. And many people really admired the way Lisa always stood up for herself. In high school, Lisa volunteered as a camp counselor at the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Culture in Nanaimo. It was a really great experience, and when she applied for her first job at McDonald's, she was hired right away. Lisa liked working with people. She was a definite people person. She was constantly on the phone with her friends. If they had a problem or needed someone to talk to, they would always call Lisa. She was always there to say, it's okay, don't worry about it. One thing to know about Lisa is that she was of First Nations ancestry. On her mother's side, Lisa's grandfather was the tribal chief of Tulaho Quiot First Nation on the west coast of Vancouver Island. In fact, he along with his wife, Lisa's grandmother, both attended Kakawias Residential School on Mears Island in BC. Residential schools were government-sponsored religious schools that were established to assimilate Indigenous children into Euro-Canadian culture. Abuse was common at the schools. Children were often beaten and locked in small spaces by teachers and staff for misbehaving. Numerous students were also sexually abused and a large percentage did not receive enough food to eat. The poor living conditions and malnutrition meant many children became sick with preventable diseases such as tuberculosis and influenza. From when the first one opened in the 1880s, a total of 150,000 First Nation, Inuit, and Métis children attended the residential schools. And I was really surprised to learn that the last residential school in Canada didn't close until 1996. Needless to say, generations of residential school survivors struggle with the residual trauma from them to this day, and this generational trauma is felt throughout Indigenous communities in Canada. However, Lisa's grandparents didn't feel like their trauma affected their ability to parent or their ability to be grandparents. And Lisa had a very happy upbringing and life in general. She was forever busy. She was always going off to meet friends or play sports or do one of the many artistic hobbies that she had. 
She was said to be the center of attention in every room and really was the life of the party. And as a result, Lisa had a hopping social life and always got invited out. In her teen and early adult years, Lisa loved to go out and party with her friends. But even with so much going on in her life, Lisa always made time for her brothers and her family. She was never too busy to take her brothers out for lunch or bother them about finishing their homework. By 2002, Lisa was 21 years old and was moved out of her parents' apartment, but she didn't go far as she still lived in the same apartment building as them, just in a different unit with a roommate. However, Lisa was in the process of moving to a new apartment in Northern Nanaimo. She was also set to start a new job at a call center while she was still figuring out her next steps career-wise. She had talked about possibly going back to school, like pursuing higher education, because she always had dreams of becoming a TV sports broadcaster because she loved sports. But unfortunately, she would never get the chance. On June 29th, 2002, Lisa had plans to go downtown to a nightclub with her friends to celebrate Canada Day and the 21st birthday of her friend, Dallas Hulley. Although Lisa and Dallas had previously dated, they remained close friends and he was someone that she trusted. Lisa let her parents know her plans and they were a bit unpleased with the fact that she was doing this because she was actually supposed to be moving the following morning. So they didn't really like the idea of her going out. But Lisa reassured them that she would be totally fine to move the next morning and she left her apartment around 11 p.m. that night. Lisa and her friends arrived at the nightclub around midnight and this was a place that Lisa was pretty familiar with because she had actually worked there in the past. The place was called Jungle Cabaret and it was kind of like their go-to club. The club is actually still there to this day, but it has a different name now. It's now called Evolve Nightclub. Lisa was reportedly having a good time at the club, dancing, drinking a bit, and meeting some new people. And it was around 2.30 a.m. when the club was about to close for the night, when one of the people in Lisa's group struck up a conversation with a young man by the name of Christopher. Christopher asked the group if they would wanna continue the night and go to a house party with him. Lisa and her friends were having a great time. The night was still young. So they decided to tag along. Not to mention Christopher seemed like a really nice guy and he even offered to drive them. So Lisa and her friends piled into his car and they took off. Lisa and her friends hung out at this house party for about an hour before they headed to another house party with Christopher in the Westwood Lake area of Nanaimo. Shortly after arriving at this second party, Lisa began to get really hungry and there wasn't anything she could eat at the house because she was vegetarian. That was when Christopher claimed to know of a nearby Subway restaurant that was still open and offered to drive her there, which Lisa accepted. She was last seen leaving the house party in Christopher's red Jaguar around 4 a.m. on June 30th. Then half an hour later, around 4.30 a.m., Lisa's friend Dallas got a call from her. Dallas later reported that she told him Christopher took her to another house party instead of somewhere to eat. She was calling him from Christopher's car and didn't feel comfortable about the situation because she didn't know anybody at this party and was not sure exactly where she was. Dallas recalled she said something like, Dallas, I don't know what's going on. This guy won't bring me back. We're sitting in a driveway on Bowen Road and he won't bring me back. I'm bored, I'm getting pissed off. Then shortly after this, Lisa contacted Dallas again for what would be the last time when she sent him a very chilling text, which said, come get me, they won't let me leave. Since Dallas and the rest of the group were pretty intoxicated at this point, he just told her to call a cab to take her home. But instead, Lisa was never seen or heard from again. Her phone last pinged at the Departure Bay area in Nanaimo, which is about a 10 minute drive from the nightclub. The following day, Lisa's parents were just kind of waiting around, waiting for her to let them know when they could come and help her with her move. Her parents spent most of June 30th calling Lisa's cell phone. It wasn't like 
Lisa to not answer, but they thought maybe she was just getting ready for the move on her own or she was sleeping in from the night before. But late that afternoon, Lisa's roommate actually went looking for her and that's when her parents found out that Lisa didn't come home last night and her roommate said she hadn't moved any of her things. So that's when they started to panic. Her mother went to Lisa's apartment and found her daughter's phone book. She called every number in the book and no one had seen or talked to Lisa since the night before. So Joanne and Dawn frantically decided to call the police because they knew that something was wrong. But the officer who took the call seemed pretty unconcerned. The officer told them that they would need to wait 48 hours before reporting her missing. And that would be only the beginning of the downright shameful police work in this case. Her parents refused to wait. They knew their daughter. So they got to work. They started calling everyone they knew, all their family, all Lisa's friends, to, and they kind of just formed a search party and they went out and searched the coast. But finally, in the late evening on June 30th, an officer was sent to their house. He asked them a couple of questions and took a photograph of Lisa. But then he told them that he would be off for the next couple of days and they should just call him on Friday. And when he was talking to them, that was a Sunday. Joanne and Don were just shocked and very confused about why they weren't taking their daughter's disappearance seriously. From the very beginning, the young family was experiencing what so many indigenous families are forced to go through. According to Stats Canada, indigenous women are six times more likely to be victims of homicide than non-indigenous women. The disproportionate number of missing and murdered indigenous women is considered a Canadian national crisis, but the way their disappearances are typically handled by the Canadian justice system, unfortunately, doesn't reflect this, since a lot of these cases don't typically receive the time and attention from the police or the public. And Lisa's case was no different, even though her mother did her best to hide the fact that Lisa was indigenous. I'd like to hope that the handling of indigenous cases has improved since 2002, since in response to repeated calls from indigenous groups, activists, and non-government organizations, the government of Canada did establish a national inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women and girls in September of 2016. So with literally zero help from the police, Lisa's family decided to go to the local news media and a reporter came out to their home right away and took the case seriously. And luckily, the next day, Lisa's case was all over the news. A few days later, police told Joanne and Dawn that the RCMP's serious crime unit was investigating Lisa's case. And they did eventually announce that they believed Lisa was a victim of foul play. In late July, 2002, so one month after Lisa's disappearance, Police tracked down the driver of the Red Jaguar, and he was six hours away in Kelowna, BC. The man was 27-year-old Christopher Adair, and Christopher was no stranger to the law. He was previously charged with assault, fraud, and theft in British Columbia. He was also charged with unauthorized use of credit cards in Alberta. When he was questioned by the RCMP about Lisa's disappearance, he claimed to have dropped Lisa off later that night and she planned to call a taxi, despite no record of that. Lisa's mother was taken by the RCMP to a meeting with Christopher in what I can only assume was a tactic to trigger an emotional response from him. She stated that during this meeting, she asked him to tell her where her daughter was. And he replied, I can't, I'm sorry. I don't mean to disrespect your family. And then Christopher was eventually released and no charges were laid. The RCMP stated, the driver, like many others involved in this file, is simply a person of interest. And the RCMP did interview over 100 people as part of their investigation, but no other person of interest has ever been named to the public. 
The Jaguar itself was eventually located and seized by the RCMP for inspection. Turns out the car was owned by Christopher's grandmother, who was a prominent realtor in BC. And shortly after Lisa's disappearance, she sold the car. Not suspicious at all. And when they did actually track it down, it had been steam cleaned. So any evidence that would have been in there was lost. Christopher's grandmother actually threatened to sue anyone who implicated her grandson in Lisa's disappearance. After she sold the vehicle, she gave Christopher money to leave Nanaimo. He fled the moment his connection to Lisa's disappearance was made public and his current whereabouts are unknown, which is so suspicious on so many levels. Then in September, 2002, the police conducted their first land search for Lisa in the area her cell phone last pinged, a whole two months after she disappeared. As far as we know, nothing of use was found. I couldn't find any explanation as to why the RCMP waited two months to actually search this area. You know, she went missing in summer, in June, and so there wasn't any hazardous weather conditions or anything. Lisa's family had done a lot of searching on their own. They contacted Lisa's friends and spoke to people in the community and surrounding areas. Her parents really had to take this investigation into their own hands, which is honestly just unbelievable. I feel so bad for them. Not only did they have to deal with the fact that Lisa was missing, but also struggle with the police acting like she didn't even matter. It's just, Awful. And the next thing they knew, an entire year had gone by without any developments in the case. But her family didn't give up. In 2003, Lisa's mother arranged for certified divers to search the reservoirs that were near the area where that second house party was, but nothing was found. And the years just kept on passing by without any new developments. It is nearly eight years to the day since a young woman in Nanaimo disappeared without a trace. 21-year-old Lisa Marie Young was last seen at a downtown nightclub and at a number of house parties in the early morning hours of June 30th, 2002. The trail may have gone cold, but police and her family have never given up hope that they will eventually find whoever is responsible for her disappearance. People assume that it gets easier. Unless you've lost a child yourself, you'll probably never be able to That's imagine hard. how the last eight years have been for Joanne Young. Like a lot of people say, like, oh, well, it doesn't seem like eight years, and, you know, like, has it been that long, and not when they live day to day. Joanne's daughter, Lisa Marie Young, was 21 years old when she went missing in the early hours of June 30th, 2002. She made the wrong choice that night by accepting a ride with someone she didn't know. For years, Lisa's mother asked the police to work with Crime Stoppers to film a reenactment of Lisa's disappearance. And according to her, they really resisted. But finally, in May 2009, the Nanaimo RCMP released a Crime Stoppers reenactment of the night Lisa went missing, which I played earlier. In contrast to their experience with the police, the family had a lot of support from the community. People they never imagined would be on the journey with them who worked to keep Lisa's memory alive. There were several candlelight vigils held for Lisa over the years, and the community pitched to put up a billboard with Lisa's picture on it. Lisa's family also took part in Walk for Justice, which is a group of activists and family members who walked all the way from Vancouver to Ottawa for a public inquiry into the unsolved disappearances and murders of women across Canada. And then sadly, in 2017, Lisa's mother, Joanna, passed away from kidney failure. She died without ever finding out what happened to the daughter she spent the last 15 years fighting for. Dawn and other loved ones continue to bring awareness to Lisa's case with vigils, posters, and billboards. Then in 2018, another tragic death kind of around this case happened when Dallas Hully, the last person to receive any communication from Lisa, passed away after being struck by a car. Then, without any news or any developments for years and years, the case finally had some new activity. 
In December 2020, the RCMP conducted searches related to the case at two locations in Nanaimo. One of the locations was a residential property located at 827 Nanaimo Lakes Road, and the other was at Morrell Sanctuary. When I checked these places out on a map, they were both in the Westwoods Lakes area where that second house party was. Unfortunately, there aren't any details on what sparked these searches, but one can assume that the RCMP received some kind of tip. And that's the thing with cases like these. Someone knows something and it could come down to it only being a matter of time before that person decides to come forward. Then in June 2021, the Nanaimo RCMP hosted a press conference to provide an update on the status of the investigation. They reported that based on new and historical information, numerous searches for Lisa have taken place in the last year. They utilized ground penetrating radar and police dogs. And he said additional searches at undisclosed locations were planned. There have been no arrests made in connection to Lisa's disappearance, despite police having received hundreds of tips related to her case. The answer to this case just seems so obvious to me. Lisa left the party with a man she didn't know, who she told her friend wouldn't let her leave. Christopher started a conversation with them, he invited them to a house party, and it seems like he was just waiting for an opportunity to get one of them alone. That's all I'm gonna say, because I don't want to get sued by his grandmother. Lisa had a band of flowers tattooed on her right bicep and two dolphins on her lower back. She was last seen wearing a black tank top, a black skirt, and black high-heeled, thigh-high boots. Today, Lisa would be 41 years old. Investigators ask for anyone who may have seen a red jaguar in a suspicious area between 3.30 a.m. and 2 p.m. in Nanaimo on June 30th to come forward and help bring a family closure. A $50,000 reward is being offered and you can contact the Nanaimo RCMP at 250-754-2345. That's all I have for today. Please let me know what you think about this case in the comment section below. And let me know if there are any cases that you guys want me to cover here on this channel. If you like this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more true crime content. I'll see you in the next one.